Hello, my name is Peter Deagle. I'm chairing today's RSS webinar. I believe we'll have Brad Efron on the line. Hello, Brad. Hi, Peter. And uh, uh, we have Andrew Gellman lined up as our invited discussant. But uh, I would like to encourage uh, anybody, any of the audience who wants to join in the Q&A session at the end, you can either write your question, in which case I'll read it out for you at the end of the um, presentation. You need to use the Q&A icon at the top of the screen. Or if you do want to actually speak directly, then you can press star on your phone to unmute yourself. Please do remember to mute yourself uh, when you've finished. I should uh, say we're grateful to Quintiles for their generous sponsorship of this series of journal webinars, and, and I'm particularly grateful to HQ staff, Jack and Judith, for all the work they've been doing behind the scenes. It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Brad Efron as today's speaker. I mean, Brad is extremely well known all around the world as one of our most distinguished statisticians, but in particular, I think everyone would recognize that Brad in particular was doing data science a long time before the term was invented. And he's always been one of the real deep thinkers about the, the interface between statistics and computer science and the implications of that for the future of our discipline. And, and I'm sure he won't mind me mentioning that he has a book in preparation with Trevor Hasty with the captivating title Computer Age Statistical Inference. And I, for one, am looking forward to that very much. But without uh, further ado, Brad, if you're ready to, to go, you'll be in charge of the presentation, and then we'll move to Q&A when you, when you finish. Okay, thank you, Peter. Okay, my thanks to the RSS and to you and to Judith. Uh, so this is sort of a 21st century discussion paper, I guess. A notable trend of the past 25 years is the increased use of Bayesian methods in statistical applications. Uh, this paper concerns the frequentist evaluation of Bayesian estimates. And I'll uh, begin the, 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 in the usual way with a family of probability densities. Uh, it says script F equals F sub mu of X, uh, where both mu and X so you, would usually be high dimensional. Um, and it assumes we have, a, I, I'm going to assume we have a parameter, a real valued parameter, theta equals T of mu. Um, that's of special interest that we want to make some inference about. And uh, uh, and we've got a prior pi of mu, and we want to get an estimate of theta, and the usual estimate, the Bayesian estimate, theta hat in the box, the expected value of theta given x. Uh, is the ratio of two integrals, and the, uh, that would be, um, uh, th that's the estimate we're interested in, and the question arises is how accurate is theta hat? And the usual answer would be from, uh, would be taken from the Bayesian posterior distribution, uh, say the standard deviation of theta given x, and, and this is obviously right, the right answer is the prior pi of mu is based on genuine past experience. Um, but it's not so obvious otherwise. Um, uh, most Bayes applications these days use uninformative priors, uh, such as Jeffrey's prior, uh, uh, pi of mu equals the uh, determinant of the Fisher information matrix to the one-half power. And uh, there's a danger of circular reasoning here, uh, where self-selected prior is used to assess its own estimate's accuracy. Uh, and, and this, in this paper, uh, we're going to just think of Bayes' estimate theta hat as a function of the data x and evaluate its frequentist accuracy. So on to the next slide. Um, and the, uh, this is the uh, main result of the paper. Uh, it says the general accuracy formula, we're on slide three. Um, and uh, the general here means that it, it, it's for any prior, not necessarily an uninformative one. So we have... Uh, I'm going to assume that uh, uh, x and mu are both in our uh, p-dimensional space, and that x is unbiased for mu with a covariance matrix V of mu. And then the crucial quantity is in uh, red or pink there on the third line. Alpha x of mu is the gradient with respect to x of logs of f of mu of x. Um, not, not with respect to mu, as would be for the usual score function. You might call this... Uh, the Bayesian score function, where you take the gradient with respect to x. And the uh, key lemma um, uh, says how the posterior expectation changes as a function of x. It says the gradient 
of theta hat with respect to x is the posterior covariance between t of mu, this parameter of special interest, and alpha x of mu, given x. I'm going to call that cove hat for short. And the theorem there at the bottom is uh, then that the standard, the delta method standard deviation of theta, that's frequent of standard deviation, is a box at the bottom, SD of theta hat uh, equals cove hat transpose the covariance matrix cove hat to the one half power. And now we're on uh, page, uh, the next page, page four. And uh, the nice thing about the theorem is it's easy to implement in practice. Uh, uh, so suppose, uh, suppose we start out with an MCMC sample of uh, uh, size B, like B is going to be 10,000 or something like that. Mu, mu 1 star, mu 2 star, mu B star. Uh, this is a sample of the basic vectors. Uh, the, the full parameter vectors. And then uh, for each i, uh, for each one of those, we can take t of mu i star equals t i star for short notation, and alpha i star equals that alpha thing for the uh, the uh, i uh, MCMC replication. Um, and then uh, the average of the t i stars would, would be the usual MCMC estimate of theta hat, the posterior expectation. Theta hat equals the summation ti star over b. Um, and now we can estimate the covariance in the theorem in the same way, in the usual way, by just taking, and it's in the box there, uh, by just taking uh, the uh, empirical covariance over the MCMC replications. Um, and then at the bottom we get the uh, frequent of standard error from the theorem, SD hat equals cove hat transpose V of X cove hat to the one-half power. Uh, and uh, so the main point is that the same sample that gives theta hat also gives its frequent uh, standard deviation. So now the next slide uh, starts on one of the main examples in the paper, uh, the diabetes data which uh, uh, was analyzed in a couple previous papers, and in particular, a uh, nice paper by Park and Casella in 2008. Uh, what happened here? Uh, what happened to the diabetes data? Uh, so we're on, uh, we're on slide five there, uh, diabetes data. Uh, Park and Casella, uh, uh, the data has 442 uh, subjects, there are 442 diabetic patients were each measured on P equals 10 predictors at baseline when they came in the clinic. It was age, sex, body mass index, blood glucose, and some other measurements. And the, um, the response variable Y was disease progression one year later. And, uh, and, for, and by putting the data in the right form, we can ha use a regular linear, normal linear model that vector y, that's all 442 y values for all the patients, equals x alpha plus e, where e is no, standard normal noise. Um, uh, x is the structure matrix. It's a, a 442 by 10 matrix in which the i throw are the 10 predictors for the i subject. Alpha um, is the parameter of interest, uh, parameter vector. Um, and um, it's, uh, uh, it's unknown, of course. Um, and uh, Park and Kinsella, uh chose uh, as their prior, a, a prior that's related to the lasso, but I won't, we're not going to say anything more about the lasso. It's a um, multidimensional Laplace prior, pi of alpha, alpha's playing the role of mu in the here, e to the minus lambda alpha norm one, that is, e to the minus lambda, the sum of the absolute values of the alphas. And uh, Park and Casella peeked at the data and used lambda equals 0.37, but we won't worry about that. We'll just assume that that was the prior they took. So now we're on the next page, uh, page six. And uh, I've taken, uh, I have to choose a special uh, parameter of interest. I'm choosing. Uh, Let's say for subject J, theta J 
is XJ transpose alpha. That's the predicted value for patient A if we actually knew alpha. Um, and now we're going to use the MCMC to get get at that. Uh, uh, so Park and Casella actually put together a rather clever MCMC algorithm, and I've uh, uh, we, we uh, uh, generated 10,000 values after burn-in from that alpha one star, alpha two star through alpha B star, B equals 10,000, and then for the J person, uh, TJ star. TJI star is XJ transpose alpha star. That's the uh, the uh, posterior record. Uh, that that's the uh, MCMC uh, choice for that that particular subject. And then when we average those 10,000 TJI stars, we get the estimate theta hat J uh, for that person, that patient. Uh, and I, and for some reason, and I somewhat regretted this, as you'll see, um, I, I chose patient 125 uh, to, to focus attention on in the paper. And the third line down, it says theta hat 125 equals 0.248. That was the estimate of uh, theta 125. And the usual base standard deviation, uh, just taking the uh, standard deviation of the TJI stars, was 0.072, and uh, uh, then I went and applied that theorem, and I thought I'd get something much different, but I didn't. The, the frequent of standard deviation is 0.071, uh, and this sort of uh, surprised me, uh, and I looked a little more uh, for the um, uh, for for the simple case that we have here. Uh, you can do a theoretical calculation. It's in the box that the ratio of the frequentists to the base standard deviations is uh, a certain uh, uh, ratio on the right there, x transpose sigma hat g sigma hat x divided by x transpose sigma hat x to the one-half power. Um, and uh, there g is x transpose x and sigma hat the empirical covariance matrix of the alpha i stars. Um, the, um, and that, that means that, that that ratio has to be in the range of the square root of the eigenvalues of sigma to the one-half, g sigma to the one-half. And for this particular problem, when I did the number, it came out between 1.007 and 0.313. So I almost cer certainly was going to get a number uh, less than one for that ratio. That is, the, the frequent of standard deviation less than the base, not much less in this case. So if we go on to the next slide, uh, slide 11, uh, slide, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, slide 7, uh, 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 there's the that ratio for all 442 uh, subjects, and you'll see that I happen to have chosen a subject near the upper end of the range. Um, the, the average overall uh, 442 subjects was about 0.95, so or actually about 0.96. So the uh, 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 the Bayes uh, rule in this case was a mild shrinker of the uh, 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 in terms of standard deviations. On the next page, that's page eight. Um, it's, uh, I'm going to do another, uh, there's nothing very interesting so far, the, well, maybe reassuring, the frequentist and the Bayesian standard error came out to be about the same. Here's a quite different kind of application. Um, we, we can apply the accuracy formula to any other statistic theta hat using the same 10,000 MCMCs, alpha I star. Um, uh, we don't have to redo the MCMC business. Uh, suppose we're interested in the posterior CDF of theta 125, um, the prediction for uh, patient number 125. Uh, uh, that is, I'd like to know its CDF, not just its expectation. So instead of TI star now, uh, I compute SI star, uh, the indicator of whether TI star is less than some threshold C. And I'm going to call that CDF hat of C on the second line there. And in particular, for for example, uh, C 
CDF uh, had of 0.3 was 0.762, 76% chance posterior. That subject 125's actual prediction is less than 0.3. And the frequent of standard error deviation uh, using the uh, um, formula, the theorem, was point, plus or minus 0.304. So in this case, it was quite large. Um, the upper credible limit, 95% credible limit, um, is uh, 0.34. That is, CDF hat of 0.34 is 0.95. So that would be the number you'd usually uh, quote as the upper limit, 95% base credible limit. And that number was, mod according to the theorem, was moderately uh, accurate, about 20%. Uh, coefficient of variation, its, its standard deviation, frequent of standard deviation, was 0.07. Uh, and it's worth noting that the uh, that 0.34 from the Bayesian point of view, if you take the prior as given, uh, as accurate, has no error. That is, uh, it's, it's exact. It's what you get from the uh, Bayes theorem. Uh, the, the error here is a uh, uh, is, is a frequentist error. So on the next page, um, I've, the uh, is a graph. We're on page nine. Uh, the the black curve is the uh, is the whole CDF for subject one twenty five, and um, and it looks pretty. Uh, convincing there, uh, and of course, as I said, that's exact uh, in the Bayesian world. If I, um, but what you can see, um, the red vertical uh, bars are plus or minus one frequent of standard deviation, uh, so that uh, you can see there's quite a bit of noise. Um, and the interpretation would be that if we reran the the, um, the usual frequentist interpretation, if we reran the diabetes study with 442 new patients, uh, the equivalent of patient 125 might have a quite different posterior CDF. Going on to the next page, um, and now I'm going to be, uh, the rest of the talk is from uh, sections three and four of the paper. Um, uh, this is an exponential families. Uh, nice things happen with the theory in exponential families. Uh, it, the accuracy formula gets easier to apply. I've written the um, family of uh, densities uh, for an exponential family notation here. F sub alpha of beta hat equals e to the alpha tra uh, transpose beta hat minus psi of alpha F naught of beta hat. And here, uh, Alpha is the natural parameter. Beta hat is, is a sufficient statistic that's usually to be a function of all the data, some known function of all the data. And uh, so now, given my original notation, alpha is playing the role of mu and beta hat is playing the role of x. And what the nice thing that happens in exponential families is that what I call Bayesian score function, alpha x of mu, is just the same as alpha. And that means in the box there, the standard deviation formula takes a simple form. Uh, that covariance is the posterior covariance between the t, the t of alpha, the, the one-dimensional parameter of interest, and alpha. So uh, life is easier there. On the next page, um, and this is slide 11. Um, uh, the general accuracy formula, I, I want to go a little deeper into the problem of uh, the frequentist accuracy of Bayes estimates. Uh, the general accuracy formula only gives a frequentist standard deviation for the posterior expectation theta hat. And, and you can do better in exponential families. You can get whole frequentist confidence intervals. And I'll, I'll get at this uh, in a couple steps. Um, it says in the second line, g alpha, g hat alpha beta equals beta hat is probability 1 over b on each alpha i star. Uh, that is, so we had 10,000 of those 
tau phi stars, there were 10 vectors in our original problem. If we put probability one-tenth on them, uh, one uh, ten-thousandth on each of them, we get a, uh, a um, approximation, a simulation approximation of the uh, posterior distribution, g alpha, given beta equals beta hat. And, and what happens that's nice is that suppose I ask, well, what's the posterior distribution if beta equals something else besides beta hat, if I change the sufficient statistic to some other value? And uh, it, it turns out that a certain reweighting of those, uh, ten, the same 10,000 MCMCs, you don't have to change them, but uh, there's a certain reweighting that's written there on the page that uh, uh, that get, gets the uh, that gives you the uh, right conditional distribution, and by uh, varying the weightings, uh, one obtains bootstrap confidence intervals for T of alpha without f further simulation. And the, the names that I've used in the past is things like BCA and ABC. So on the next page um, is that graph again of the CDF. We're on page 12. Um, the black curve is the black curve you saw before. Then now the vertical blue lines are um, uh, frequentest 95% central confidence intervals at each point on the curve. And now you'll notice that they don't go outside the range minus uh, zero to one. So uh, this gives you perhaps a more accurate idea of the frequentest variability of uh, of the uh, uh, Bayes estimate, Bayes CDF in this case. Going a little further now along this line, um, the um, uh, we're up to page 13 now. It says bootstrap estimates of a posterior distribution. Um, uh, MCMC isn't the only way to, stimu to simulate uh, posterior distribution. Uh, so I'm going to back to the original notation where the family of densities or distributions is F sub mu of X. And now, so, um, what we did before, we took a mu, uh, uh, MCMC sample, mu, mu 1 star through mu B star, and we approximated the posterior distribution G sub mu of X uh, with a uniform weight on, on each of the 10,000 points. Uh, uh, another way to go at it is instead to take a parametric bootstrap sample. So the parametric bootstrap sample, I'm on the third bullet down. Uh, uh, the MLE mu hat, uh, we resample mu hat I star from F of mu hat. I put a hat on the things now so they're different. Um, and it turns out you can approximate. So now, say I did 10,000 bootstraps instead of MCMCs, uh, that that they wouldn't be a uh, depiction of the posterior distribution. But it turns out that if you reweight things uh, correctly, you do get a, a, a description of it. Uh, and there is a formula in the paper for doing the correct reweighting. So on, on the um, on slide 14, uh, I just um, there's some advantages to uh, uh, doing the uh, simulation with the bootstrap when when it can be done, which is not always. Um, and that one way to think about it is a question of how big to take uh, uh, B 10,000 was 10,000 enough with the bootstrap sampling. Bootstrap sampling is IID. Uh, once one has the data in hand, and that means you can use standard uh, sampling theory estimates uh, to get in the internal accuracy. And in particular, uh, for this particular problem that we had before, with B equals 10,000 bootstraps, the coefficient of variation of of the internal accuracy would be only 0.01. That is, uh, we. Uh, it wouldn't pay to go on any further. We could have stopped earlier. That doesn't mean that was true for the MCMCs because they're not IID sample. The next uh, page, 
uh, raises a, a more general question: is how, how uninformative is a prior? Uh, if one if one proposes an uninformative prior, it's reasonable to ask uh, how uninformative it actually is. Um, and one one definition or one measure is what I've called delta there. Uh, uh, the difference between the Bayes' posterior expectation and the MLE uh, divided by uh, measured in units of the MLE standard deviation. And for subject 125, that number came out to be minus 0 .9, 0 0.90. So the prior, the Park and Casella prior, moved our uh, uh, estimate for uh, from from the MLE down about a one standard error, uh, which is substantial. If it had been, say, two or three standard errors, uh, one would have to wonder, uh, do we know enough in that prior uh, to justify making such a big change? Here's uh, the next slide. Uh, uh, 16 is the histogram of all uh, uh, 442 subjects, uh, their deltas, how much it moved. And once again, it turned out that subject 125 was an extreme point or near an extreme. Most of the subjects changed less than that. So, uh, in fact, the Park and Costello prior didn't have an enormous effect, even though they didn't choose it to be uninformative. And finally, on the, um, on the next slide, uh, the um, uh, I've plotted uh, along the horizontal, horizontal axis the MLE and uh, along the vertical axis the Bayes estimate, and there, it's a very linear plot. Um, it turns out the Bayes estimates uh, a good, that square, uh, dash uh, straight line has slope about 0.968. So one way to say it is that the uh, 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 the, the Park and Casella prior amounted to a shrinkage estimate of about 97%. Uh, so finally, on the last slide, uh, there are some uh, references, and of course in the paper uh, there's a lot more references. Uh, so let me just say in, in conclusion, um, uh, objective Bayes methods have certainly become popular in applications, along with, a, I think, a sometimes casual attitude uh, toward their effects on statistical analysis. Um, uh, one of my early mentors uh, advised me to think like a Bayesian but worry like a frequentist. And so this, this paper uh, g gives a new way to worry about Bayesian estimates of accuracy. And I'll, I'll certainly be interested in what Andrew Gelman and the other listeners have to say. Again, my thanks to the uh, RSFs. Thank you, Brad. Thank you very much. And our thanks to you as well uh, for, for that uh, very lucid presentation. Uh, uh, un unless I am incompetent, which is entirely possible with how this technology works, I'm not aware of any pressing questions at the moment from the audience at large, but I would encourage those of you, those 200 or so of you who are on the line, if you do have a question, please uh, get it through to us. But, uh, Andrew, are you, uh, are you on the line there? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Andrew. So, Andrew Gelman from Columbia uh, is going to open the discussion. Imagine we characterize a problem by the amount of data and the number of parameters. It seems to me that the so-called Stanford School of Statistics focuses on problems with lots of data relative to the number of parameters in the model. That is, in the Stanford School, we see dense data and a sparse model. And indeed, um, Brad, your colleague Rob Tipchirani has pro proposed a bet on sparsity principle based on the idea that sparse models are ultimately all we can ever really fit to data. An example of such a data-dense parameter sparse problem is in one of those genetic settings with millions of data points but where only a few dozen uh, non-zero parameters are being estimated. Other, other settings include feature selection problems in machine learning. You might call them needle and haystack problems. There are, of course, lots of such problems, and I think the Stanford School of Statistics has been extremely successful, both within the field of statistics and in many applications, at finding needles in haystacks. Now, from the other direction, I see informative Bayesian inference of the sort that I do as being most helpful for problems with sparse data and dense models, problems that you might describe as finding a haystack in a needle. 
Now, for such problems, prior information is essential. Examples that I've worked on include item response models in psychology, ideal point models in political science, post-stratification and survey research, and physiological pharmacokinetic models. These are all examples where prior information can help you estimate the haystack from a few needles of data. There are also examples maybe not so interesting to you, but unfortunately with a high profile in science recently of studies that are so weak that easily available prior information dominates the data at hand. Here Bayesian methods can be helpful in the negative sense of demonstrating the hopelessness of trying to draw strong conclusions from these studies, whether or not they are, quote, statistically significant. Okay, with that as background, here's my question. Do you think that the frequency evaluations in your paper are sensitive to the regimes that you're studying? I'm guessing that in dense data sparse model problems, priors won't matter so much, and non-informative Bayesian estimates can make sense. But in sparse data dense model problems, informative priors would be crucial, and non-informative priors won't do the job. What do you think? So uh, that's an interesting distinction. Uh, uh, typically here I, I've seen the lasso apply to uh, P greater than N problems. That is, a lot more parameters than, uh, than data, uh, uh, than sample size. So I'm not quite sure which side of that, uh, uh, the denseness, that, which, one, which one is it? Um, yeah, so in in some sense, the lasso is used to sparsify the problem. That is to make a solution something like a classical p less than n situation. Uh, I suspect, on general principles, that the paper's accuracy formula will perform better when p isn't too big. Uh, the number of parameters, um, the infinitesimal jackknife standard deviation estimates, um, tend to become upwardly biased as uh, p gets bigger. Uh, requiring bias corrections, and some hints of that are in section 6.4. Oh, just to answer what Brad said, I would consider the when you have when people apply the lasso um, where they have more predictors than data points, but then the goal is to choose just a small number of predictors. I would consider that still aiming for sparsity. So that's sort of why I would put it in that category. So question one was pretty long, so maybe now I should follow up with a quick one. Um, one thing I like about your work, Brad, is its non-ideological nature. Um, now, in this particular paper, I'm, I'm actually not sure what's your practical message. Um, so is it A, don't trust Bayesian inference unless they're accompanied with a theoretical or simulation study showing they have close to nominal coverage? Or is it B, do trust non-informative Bayesian methods because they can be viewed as good approximations to frequency calibrated intervals? Or C, something else entirely. And I do think probably the audience would be curious to know whether your message is that don't trust Bayes until you've checked it, or I, Brad, have checked it, and now you can trust Bayes. Brad. Okay, well, that's a good question. Um, uh, the, the, the background of this paper, in my mind, uh, is the feeling that, uh, uh, first of all, that uh, uh, Various forms of uninformative or convenience priors have really become uh, uh, much used in applied statistics. So I looked at the, um, I got an, uh, an edition of uh, the 2014 December edition of the Annals of Applied Statistics, and there were 24 papers, and eight of them were uh, of a Bayesian um, background, and all eight of those were of the uninformative prior type. Um, and, uh, I, I, and, and what the, the reason people are doing this is uh, quite reasonable. Uh, uh, these are complicated problems, and getting the, the uh, formula set up the uninformative prior, uh, go and use MCMC or something, and get the answer is very attractive. I do think that um, um, it can uh, it's led to somewhat of a casual attitude. So uh, prior distributions not based on rele relevant past experience can be very useful for constructing estimates in complicated situations, but I think they should be critically checked for unintended consequences. And I, I've been doing some work not in the paper, trying to trying to um, see when and when it when it does and when it doesn't work, 
you have a high dimensional problem, uh, then you have one dimension of it that that's of particular interest. You have to be quite careful about what uninformative means. Um, so uh, the purpose of this paper is to provide a check on things. Uh, uh, so, for example, um, in the um, in the case of the CDF, the um, uh, Bayes estimates seem to be uh, ideal or perfect because within their framework they are, but uh, in, they obviously have some noise in them, and, it, and the theorem gives one way to see that. Um, the, uh, near the end there, uh, the, the simpler idea of just checking to see if you've made a large difference between the Bayes point estimate and the MLE uh, is a good thing to do. And this goes back, the idea here goes back to uh, work that I did with uh, uh, Carl Morris really a long time ago uh, with, with um, the James Stein estimate, which has that same flavor. Uh, the James Stein estimate shrinks uh, the MLE uh, toward a central value, and Carl and I noticed that you should be careful if, you, if you're shrinking any one estimate an awful lot, there's a chance you're being rough on that particular case. Uh, so this is another way to do that. Okay, thank you, Brad. Uh, I have a question from Gesina Reinert, uh, presume speaking from Oxford, Gesina. Uh, I'll read it out for her. She's put it in the Q&A box. Uh, the delta method approximation works well in many examples, but not always. Can there be a problem in applying the key lemma in some examples? Uh, good question. The, the delta method works best on very smooth uh, when uh, the estimate is a smooth function of the data. And one of the good things here is that Bayes estimates tend to be very smooth functions of the data. Uh, they uh, uh, that that's one of the nice things about Bayesian theory. So yes, it tends to work well. Uh, uh, I, I I like the um, uh, you'll notice that it's a theory about standard deviations. Uh, when you go to the confidence intervals, which is harder work, or at least more, you have to think more about what's going on. You also get some estimation of bias uh, there. Uh, so that's one of the things that can go wrong. Uh, I guess what I'd say is that the uh, 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 the delta method is a first and rather crude estimate of getting a standard error, and you definitely can do better by working harder. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that, Brad. Um, again, I'll just pause briefly in case anybody from the wider audience wants to jump in. Okay. Uh, in the absence of that, Andrew, uh, th I think you have a question three. Um, I have a third prepared question, but I actually wanted to bring up something else which came up a couple times in Brad's discussion. Um, no, no, feel free. Which, which, feel free. Um, so he said most Bayesians use uninformative priors such as Jeffrey's prior. Um, so it might be that most people do that, but I, I wouldn't do that myself. Um, in fact, in my own work, um, I would – I've really moved away from uninformative priors. Um, my, my, my books have not even really caught up to my own practice in this. Um, I will just about always use at least a weekly informative prior and maybe more. Um, so let me just have a quick definition that in, an informative prior can be useful um, because you actually often have prior information. And that sounds obvious, but I think <laughs> – for many years, Bayesians, including myself, operated under under a sort of cringe principle of being embarrassed to be Bayesian and embarrassed to use prior information. Um, in recent years, I've realized that a lot of problems, we have a lot of prior information that, that we can use. So that's changed my view. Um, but then even beyond that, when I don't have strong prior information, I found that a little bit of weak prior information can regularize a problem. So I don't know. This is more of a statement than a question, but maybe I'll ask Brad for his reactions. Like, let's say that to Brad that if you're moving into a world where people are regularly using weakly informative priors at the very least and often using informative priors, how would that change your thinking? Uh, the, the, well, I've been thinking about similar things, Andrew. Uh, the... Uh, as far as I can see from looking at the literature, people like 
uh, weekly informative priors uh, that avoid infinities of various sorts are quite popular now. Uh, the um, Park and Casella prior wasn't exactly uninformative. Uh, it was, a, it, I think, it was intended to be somewhat of a shrinkage prior, uh, and uh, uh, it, I was a little surprised it turned out not to shrink very much. Um, so it probably it would it was probably giving pretty good answers. Um, the theorem doesn't have anything to do with whether things are really uninformative or not, but how you how you think of the of the theorem's re results, the accuracy formula's results does. If you're very sure the your prior, uh, there's no reason to be interested in the frequentist uh, properties of the estimator. Uh, the only reason to be interested in that is if you're not so sure of the uh, uh, of the prior's relevance. I think often I'm in an intermediate stage in which my prior can sort of rule things out. The example might be I'm doing an econ analysis and I'm estimating the elasticity. And I'm pretty sure the elasticity is between 0 and 1. And I think it's more likely to be a half and less likely to be 0.99 or 0.01. Um, I have weak data, so I'd like to put in some prior information, but it's not that I believe that my prior is the truth. I just want to get a more stable estimate. So I have the intuition that the kind of stuff you're doing is important, and I, I just wonder if there's sort of the next generation of theory which would say, yes, we're interested in frequency properties, but we're particularly interested in frequency properties around the range of our prior. So something that sort of goes halfway between a, I like a sort of full base and full frequentist. Well, yeah, and I think we're thinking on the same page here. Uh, I, you know, first of all, there's nothing to stop you from doing both of them, and uh, and uh, and seeing if they agree, like they did in a couple of the problems in the paper. Uh, you feel pretty good about the whole thing. If they disagree violently, then there's some thinking to be done. And maybe there's an intermediate, as you suggest, an intermediate uh, uh, form of estimation to be brought into into play. Um, yeah, I do think, I mean, I think that there's been a lot of, there's some work in this area and there more can be done. So should I ask question number three or is there another? Go ahead. Okay. Um, so this is a longer one. Um, as we've discussed in the past, one thing I find appealing about frequentist inference is that it makes no claim to coherence. Now, I mean that seriously, like it's, I'm not trying to make a joke here. Um, I think coherence can be a trap. Um, so, for example, the bootstrap, which has been so useful to many researchers, including myself, is inherently a dualistic approach in that it requires two different things, an estimator, theta hat of y, and a bootstrap distribution over the data Y. In general, there needs to be no connection between theta hat and the bootstrap distribution. For example, theta hat might be a least squares estimate or even something Bayesian, like a penalized maximum likelihood estimate, while the bootstrap distribution of Y might be a simple permutation of the raw data, or it could be a more model-based parametric bootstrap, or something in between, like a model-based simulation bootstrapping over residuals. The point is that the statistical procedure has two separate parts. Discussions of the bootstrap typically focus on the second part, the bootstrap distribution over Y, but the estimator theta hat of Y is just as important, maybe more so. Now, I've long thought that to really compete, Bayesian inference needs this sort of creative incoherence as well. My personal solution has been to separate inference, that is parameter estimation, standard errors, and so forth, from model checking which is based on comparing data to replications from the sampling distribution. Thus, I do not follow the standard perspective of theoretical statistics in which interval estimates are simply the dual or inversion of hypothesis tests. I think of estimation and testing as two fundamentally different processes, with model comparison being perhaps a third process. Anyway, I was wondering what you think about this. I conjecture that if you let go of the idea that interval estimates are the inversions of hypothesis tests, you'll be able to get more out of your statistical methods. To put it another way, perhaps you can view the notorious difficulty of obtaining bootstrap confidence intervals as a feature rather than a bug if you consider interval estimates to be defined conditional on some basket of assumptions and then consider model checking to be a separate problem. So 
So I wonder what you think about that idea of creative incoherence. Oh, good. Well, uh, you've got a lot of points in there, uh, good ones, too. Uh, the, uh, the, the I like the part about uh, 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 liking incoherence. I do, too. Uh, uh, the uh, the different the fact is that the good thing about frequentism is is that it doesn't have to be coherent. Uh, the ingredients of a frequentist analysis are a family of probability, probability distributions and a method of interest. Just what you said, two separate things: an estimate, a test, etc. And and this gives the statistician a lot of flexibility at the price of coherence. Uh, and this is coming into play uh, a lot these days um, with these uh, enormous uh, um, data sets come out of places like Google and stuff like that, where what people do is think of some some kind of methodology to handle it, and then they go at it uh, trying to do the analysis. And their frequentism has the advantage that you don't have to try and think of uh, uh, how it fits in with uh, the prior um, Bayesian ingredients are the same as the frequentists, starting with family of probability distributions, but then they do not, in place of having a method of interest, there is a prior distribution, after which the method is determined by Bayes' theorems, more coherence, less flexibility. Um, in, in this paper, I emphasized a connection, <coughs> a connection between bootstrap distributions, suitably reweighted, and Bayes' posterior distributions for un uninformative priors, um, as in figure two for the self in cell infusion data. And um, this was in section five, which I haven't talked about because it got too complicated, uh, this was used to argue uh, for the similarity of results from hierarchical Bayes and empirical Bayes analyses uh, of microwave-inspired data sets in section five. So uh, maybe I'm trying to have it both ways for the coherence flexibility uh, trade-off. Um, and the um, uh, so maybe one of the things I'm saying is uh, uh, simply slapping a prior on a problem doesn't give you full right to coherence. Uh, uh, you you should be careful about checking it. So you know uh, it, theoretically. Um, uh, Bayesian analysis are are immune to certain things, like they're immune to selection bias, uh, and that's part of the coherence theory. But you shouldn't take that too literally if you just place a uh, a self-selected prior on the problem. No, I, I completely agree with you on that. And one way I sometimes put it is that if you could just slap down a prior that you believe and you didn't question it, and in that case, you, there's no need for actually any statistical computing at all because you could just stare at the data and slap down the posterior that you believe. So, like, like obviously, any distribution that we write of any sort is, is an assumption, and we have to take it as an input um, rather than an, an output. Mm. Hi, Peter and Brad. It's Judith from the RSA. Um, Hi, Judith. Hi, hi. I have a question that came in earlier um, from Dr. Pablo Verde. He says, to begin with, I found very interesting the remark 6.1, where the ratio between the estimated frequentist and Bayesian SD is presented in formula, in bracket 6.6. .6. I have a very practical question. So his question is, should we use this ratio as a sort of diagnostic quantity for our Bayesian data analysis? If yes, do you have a rule of thumb for this ratio? Thank you, Pablo, who is a good friend of mine. Uh, the, um, I, I was a little surprised at the ratio, uh, as it turned out in the paper for that example. Uh, I, ha I hadn't thought about how it was going to come out. If the ratio is much different than one, I think there's time to be thinking about what's the right, uh, what's the correct uh, uh, interpretation for the accuracy of your estimate. And that gets back to what uh, uh, Andrew was saying before, uh, that you, uh, uh, there's intermediate steps between uh, taking the frequentist or taking the Bayesian uh, point of view, depending on how much confidence you might have in the 
uh, there. But no, I don't have a rule of thumb yet, uh, and I haven't really thought much about uh, about how how I would uh, do this. Uh, the the one case I thought was really that caught my interest more than any other in working on the paper was the one about the CDF of uh, of Subject 125, and I hadn't really thought much about it except for to say that uh, unless you put a, a, a that the Bayesian answer, if you take the Park Casella prior as genuine, is correct. That is, it doesn't have any error, and that that has to be wrong. You have to think some more about that. Uh, of course, the Bayesian could think more about it by putting another hierarchical prior on the Park Casella prior. Hello, Brad. It's Judith again. Hi. 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 I have another question that's come in from um, Bezad or Bezad Tabibian. It's often said that Bayesian modeling can become very confident with a lot of data, even though the model is wrong. Do you see how your approach can address this issue? Uh, uh, that was a good question, and it came up in the review of the paper. Uh, which took a long time, incidentally. Um, the, uh, uh, the, there's a standard, uh, the standard Bayesian asymptotics um, uh, say that uh, as the data swamps the prior in the way, usual way they say it, then both the frequentist and Bayesian estimates converge to the same thing having to do with the, uh, having to do with the curvature of the likelihood function at the maximum likelihood. And uh, uh, what I what I feel is that so that gives a reassuring answer. That's the traditional one of the literature that you don't have to worry about the difference between the Bayesian and the frequentist accuracies. Uh, in the uh, this theorem, uh, and the accuracy theorem is supposed to tell you what happens before the data swamps the prior, and it seems to me that's where the interest really lies. Uh, uh, if, you, if you're uh, the reason people use Bayes priors is they don't want the data to swamp the prior. Uh, they want to have some some effect of their prior opinions. Um, I was I was wondering something about like methods with poor coverage. So suppose you found that a certain procedure like will. Um, doesn't have the coverage that you want. Um, would it be possible to look at it conditional on the parameter values? I think I'm, I'm sort of circling back to this idea that, like, for a Bayesian method, the Bayesian method automatically works because the cover, if the model is true, because if you average the coverage over the prior distribution, you get the nominal coverage by, by definition. Um, so it seems like, in, in some sense, what we're concerned about if we use a proper prior is that we don't have is that our coverage with respect to the true value of the parameter isn't what we want. And so maybe you're worried because either the prior is too narrow and the true value is outside and you're getting poor coverage there, or conversely, maybe your prior is so weak that you're actually not getting good coverage over the range of parameters that are more likely to occur. So I'm wondering whether the frequentist theory, like whether it could be used not just as sort of a general idea of understanding the properties of a Bayesian method, but would it be possible to use this in a particular application to highlight um, the sensitivity of the results to aspects of the assumptions? Or is that sort of silly because if you're going to do that, you could do sensitivity analysis directly? So I guess let me phrase the question to Brad as, like, do you feel like that there could be a tool, uh, sort of an applied tool that would go with the methods, with the theory that you have, so that someone could use it when fitting a model to make a judgment about how much to trust what they did. Uh, yeah, so th this is something I've thought about but haven't gotten very far on. Uh, the, the, the one thing, uh, you know, I, 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 I sort of feel the field is working, the field being us, is working toward uh, getting uh, a better uh, combination of Bayesian and frequentist methods to bring to bear simultaneously on on problems. Um, the one thing I uh, have the encouragement uh, that I've had 
the the bootstrap, the parametric bootstrap, I think is is a link between the two uh, areas. In the parametric bootstrap, we do what you said. You start out with the parameters that you've estimated, and then you see uh, by the bootstrapping process, you see how far away you could have gotten uh, from what you actually got. Um, and now that, uh, and the part that in the paper, uh, the, and the reason I put it in the paper, uh, the, the bootstrap way instead of MCMC, is it emphasizes how what seems like a completely frequentist method, the bootstrap, actually connects rather closely with a, a completely uh, a Bayesian methods uh, as implemented by MCMC. So I do think there's some connection there, but I'm not really, uh, I'm not in a position to try and figure out exactly what the c connection is right now. I just saw another question came up here on the chat screen. Oh yes, would you like me to read it out? Sure. Bayesians often like to interrogate models with multimodal posteriors, which is one of the key advantages of summarizing one's beliefs with a posterior rather than with the MLE. Is there a way to extend the paper to assess the frequentist, or frequentist properties when a multimodal posterior rather than a closed form Bayes estimator is the target? Question from Ryan Christ. Well, I wish I'd thought of that beforehand, uh, but I haven't. Uh, the um, about all I could say is that uh, uh, it, you have to, when you get these multimodal uh, posterior distributions, or for that matter, a multimodal um, um, bootstrap posterior distribution, uh, it always worries me that uh, maybe the problem isn't as stable as I thought it was. So maybe that's occasion for thinking more, but I don't know how well the methods of this paper would handle that problem. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any more questions? Okay, um, in that case, I'd like to um, close today's session. Um, thank everybody hugely for, for dialing in. We hope you found um, it to be a, a useful um, webinar. Um, presentation and of course massive thanks to Brad um, for presenting um, and answering those questions so, so beautifully um, and to Andrew for joining us as well and asking those, those questions um, and of course uh, to Peter Diggle um, for chairing the event today. So many thanks all round. Um, a reminder, just a quick one, that the next journal webinar will be in early 2016. Um, please check the website. Um, and also, the next Professional Statisticians Forum is on the 8th of December. Um, again, please check the uh, RSS website for full details. I'd also like to um, thank Quintiles, our sponsors for the webinar. A thanks to Quintiles. Um, finally, for anybody who hasn't been able to listen to all of the, um, to, uh, the webinar, the podcast um, is available on the RSS Journal webinar page. Um, and it will also be posted onto YouTube shortly. Plus, of course, the paper is free to access until, I think, the 4th of November, so for a little while yet. So thanks again. Please, please leave your feedback. There should be a question that you can, can see for you to tell us what you thought of the session today. And any feedback at all, um, we'd be happy to act on it. So thanks, thanks again for, for joining us. Um, hope to see you or hear you um, again soon. Goodbye from the RSS.